Well, it is nine o'clock and we do want to honor your time this morning. Uh, and I know folks are still logging on and that's fine. Um, but I'm Heather Wendt. I'm with the Benton and Franklin Conservation Districts and I am the Heritage Garden Program Coordinator. And this morning I am joined by the fabulous Alyssa Carlson with the Washington State Conservation Commission and they're helping us host the webinar. Good morning, Miss Alyssa. Good morning, Heather. Really happy to be here. Whenever you ask me, I just jump at the chance. So really excited <laughs> for today's presentation. <laughs> We have an absolutely uh, phenomenal lineup uh, joining us this morning, so we're very, very excited. Um, and our first presenter is uh, Lisa Hill. And Lisa is um, really, whenever I ask anyone about hummingbirds, they're like, well, have you talked to Lisa? <laughs> Lisa Hill is our is our local expert. You're like, no, I haven't met Lisa. So now I can officially say that not only have I had the pleasure of meeting Lisa, but I got to go out and, and actually see her beautiful, beautiful landscape and her hummingbird habitat. Um, in addition to being our our local expert, but we call her our local expert, um, she is a self-taught watercolorist, an amazing artist. Uh, she's a trained horticulturalist and she's an avid birder. Um, and so we are so incredibly excited to welcome you. So welcome Lisa and uh, we're excited to see your presentation. Okay, thank you very much Heather. I appreciate you inviting me to do this. I love hummingbirds and gardening and I've been gardening and birding for many years. I'm going to start my presentation here. Just let me know for sure if you're seeing the full screen. Is that the case? Not seeing it yet. Not seeing it yet. Show my screen. How's that? Perfect. All right. You're not seeing any of the other extraneous windows, right? Nope. I think we're oh. good. Okay, good. All right. Well, I've been gardening and birding for many, many years, and over time have homed in on the best plants for the mid-Columbia region where I live in Richland, Washington. And those plants that I've homed in are also the ones that are favorites for hummingbirds. They're all perennials in zone six where I'm at, but many of them are also hardier down to zone five. And some are a little more long lived than others. Um, it's just the way it goes. Some plants live a few years and some live 20 years, but uh, I'll let you know if some of them think are the ones that are a little bit shorter lived. All of these prefer full sun or at least six to eight hours of sun per day. They, they just seem to do better and they bloom better. And I have a mix of drought tolerant plants and some that do need some extra watering. And frankly, where we live here, we get so little rain that uh, we water everything. It's just the way it is. Um, there's just a few really super hardy native plants that can survive without any extra water, but most of these that I'm gonna talk about do need some extra water. All of the photos of the hummingbirds that you're gonna see are from my husband, Larry, and almost all of the photos in general are from our yard. And we've been building our garden for about 15 years. And plants have come and gone, which is the nature of gardening. And things get mixed up all the time. But I have a perennial garden in the back that I don't know how many feet it is. Quite a lot. Things come and go. But it gets a lot of sun. And it seems to attract a lot of wonderful hummingbirds. So I want to tell you a little bit about the hummingbirds that you can see in this region. There are four species, and down in the bottom right corner, you'll see the black chinned hummingbird. That's the only species that actually breeds the nests in this area. It seems to be able to tolerate the heat and the dry, and uh, it seems to get along fine. Anna's hummingbird in the lower left is a bird that lives year round on the west side. And when we first started building our garden and getting into attracting hummingbirds, seeing an anise in this area was quite a treat. And now they're actually becoming quite commonplace. We have them in the yard all the time now. And they are probably one of the hardiest hummingbirds at anywhere. They can survive here over the winter if you have a feeder so that the nectar is not 
frozen ever during the day. And they seem to do okay in zero degrees and 10 inches of snow. The other two, the rufous hummingbird in the upper left and the calliope in the upper right are migrants that come through early spring and then they go back through down south in August, in the first part of September. All of these photos are from Larry and they're all the males of the hummingbird species. And all of the males have this beautiful throat area with the iridescent feathers called a courgette. And they have different uh, flair to their gorget. The rufous have this beautiful red, orange, just shocking flair. Um, the whole throat and under the bill and everything. The calliope is one of the few hummingbirds that actually has these detached feathers that they can flare them out into a fan shape and really catch the eye of their female companion. Anna's hummingbird has the big gorget with a little bit of flare on the side and also has a lot of color on the top of the head, on the crown and a little bit behind the eye. They're just a shocking hot pinkish rosy color. Now the black chin, usually you don't even see this violet band on the throat there. It almost always just looks pure black. And the black chin name comes from right underneath the bill is black with that purple band underneath it. But most of the time you're, you, you don't see that. And that is the only one that nests here in this region. I presented all of these plants in alphabetical order just to, to make it easier. But <laughs> first in line here happens to be one of the hummingbirds absolute favorite plants. And I pronounce this Agastache. I've heard it pronounced other ways, but we're going to settle on Agastache, sometimes called hummingbird mint and, or anise hyssop. And it really does smell like anise or black licorice. It's just a lovely, lovely scent. It is in the mint family, but it doesn't spread like mint, like spearmint or peppermint. It's a clumping mint, so it stays in a nice, nice clump. The hummingbirds seem to prefer the taller variety, like this Apache Sunset and Ava, both very, very tall. I purchased some shorter ones, and I don't recall the names, but that grow maybe 12 to 18, well, 12 inches or so. They don't seem to go to them very much. They seem to prefer the tall ones, and maybe it's because they feel safer, they can escape quick, and they can see what's going on around them a little bit better, or uh, be able to quickly get away and go to a safe perch. I'm not sure, but they do tend to prefer the tall ones. And Tutti Frutti is another one that I really, really love. They just, it blooms all summer long and they just love it. They go to it all the time. This male anise here is a younger one. He's just not got quite all his feathers thrown in for his adult plumage here. Another tutti frutti shot with the black chins male. They're, we're lucky on this shot here to see the purple on the throat. They have some fantastic maneuvers to get in and out of these flowers and whirl around them and back up and do flips. And they're so much fun to watch. And my husband has a nice camera set up, so he's able to catch some of them in flight, which is fun. Cocosmia, also known as Mount Risha, which I never call it that, but it is known as that. I always call it Cocosmia. Related to gladiolus, they are grown from a corm, which is like a flattened little bulb. And that's the best way to buy this plant is to just buy the bulb. I don't know if you can actually buy, maybe you can buy a plant that's already in a pot. But this one is uh, a nice orange color. And this Lucifer, this shocking red one, is their favorite. And it can grow quite tall, like uh, 36 inches, maybe a little more, quite tall. They love it. It's beautiful, wonderful red. And when it's done blooming, which it does have a very specific bloom time. When it's done, it's done. I cut off the flower stalks and then this interesting sharp 
stored like foliage remains, which is really nice. Oops. So a couple more shots of black chinned and rufous males on this beautiful red flower. They really do enjoy it. Kufia or firecracker plant is a new plant for me. I was familiar with it, aware of it, but I'd never grown it. And a friend gave me a couple little starts and then I found some at a nursery and bought a couple more little ones, like four inch pots. And they grew enormous this year. They were you know, two, two and a half feet tall and the hummingbird really, really, really did like it. It is semi-hardy. I'm hoping that they'll make it through the winter. We'll see. If they don't, it's okay. I didn't invest much in them. But it was a fun plant to grow. And uh, pollinators like it too. And just as a side note, if a hummingbird likes to go to a plant for the nectar, then you're probably going to get pollinators there too, which is a wonderful addition to your yard. Pesperalo, Texas red yucca, also one of their absolute favorites. Definitely drought tolerant. I have one growing where it gets more water than it needs and it doesn't bloom all that well. It does, but not that great. And I have another one where it gets no extra water and it's very robust, sends up many, many flower stalks. And the hummingbirds just love this one. Definitely likes hot, dry conditions. There's the black chin on the same plant. And Nephophia, also known as red hot poker. This one is an unusual cultivar called Nancy's Red. Most of the red hot pokers are multicolored and they are like reddish to orange at the top and then they turn yellow at the bottom of the flower stalk. And they bloom earlier, May and June. This one blooms in July and early August. And the hummingbird seems to really like it. Not their absolute favorite plant, but they do go to it. And it's a nice red orange color at that time of year. It's nice to have in the yard. Lobelia cardinalis, a perennial lobelia. Most of us are familiar with the purple annual type that you put in baskets and ponds. But this is a perennial one that grows quite tall. While I'm speaking about the tall plants, most of these plants do better if they're staked or tied up or put a tomato cage in the plant before it gets very tall, they will flop over, especially in this region with the wind. We get a lot of wind right where we're located and they can flop over. So if they get a little bit of support, it's better. Because a lot of these will grow two, three feet tall. There, I have a purple variety of this and the hummingbirds do not seem to be interested in it at all. They really do prefer the red. Honeysuckle. I have several different honeysuckles and I really, really prefer this one with the reddish flowers, this blanched sandman that's growing up the trellis there. The unfortunate thing about honeysuckle vines is they get aphids on them in the spring and the first flush of flowers is usually a little disappointing, but I sometimes I'll go and clip those all off and then the second flush of flowers seems to be at a better timing and doesn't get the aphids or there are aphid predators around that tend to take care of them a little more. But I took this picture, this was in July or August and it's doing fine. The top one here I have, this gold flame one, the hummingbird really, really like it, but it, it really does get the aphids on it. So it's up to you whether you wanna deal with that or not. And I don't spray anything on my plants and for sure, do not use any systemic pesticides, uh, insecticides on the plant because that pesticide will go up through the entire plant and even be in the nectar. So we don't want our pollinators and our hummingbirds, which are pollinators, to get any dose of that by taking the nectar. And there's a lovely shot of a male calliope on the Blanche Sandman. There are other red ones, the American Beauty, there's one called Major Wheeler, that's another one that's red. 
just off the playgrounds. Penstemon, there are lots of great penstemons that the hummingbirds really, really like. This is called scarlet penstemon, penstemon penstemon. It's very hardy. It comes up in the same spot every year, and the, the flowers are a little more petite than some penstemons. Really lovely looking plant. And this is what I would have this tied up at this point. I right? just a, a circle of that twisty green tie works fine. And I use that stuff over and over and over again. And it should stay upright or have a tomato cage down in the middle of it before it gets this tall. There is another cultivar called Elf and Pink that they like a lot too. It doesn't have to be the red one, they, they do like the pink one. Desert Penstemon, Pseudospectopoli, another one that they really like. Blooms fairly early in late May, 1st of June. Lovely magenta red violet color. If you prune off some of the spent stems, it will bloom more. Not as lush as the first flush of growth, but it will bloom for me. Phygelius or Cape Fuchsia is an unusual plant that I would say it's not that easy to find, but it's fun to grow and the hummingbirds go to it. It tends to bloom later in the summer and it does spread a little bit. So you know that you might find it creeping around on the ground and some other places, but I would not call it invasive. None of these plants are invasive. Some of them have a few seedlings, but none of them spread underground and become a big problem. The salvias, lots of wonderful salvias that they really, really like. This one is one of my favorites. I have to say I've never seen it for sale in, at a nursery. I ordered this from High Country Gardens many, many years ago, and I have a few seedlings that have come from it, and I've moved them around. It dies down to the ground every year, and so I cut off all the old stems, and it grows to four to five feet tall over the summer and blooms in September and October, which is perfect for late August for migrating hummingbirds that are coming from the north and heading back south, and the anise hummingbirds that like to hang around here in the fall and the winter, some of their favorites. But here we have a black chin female. I think it's female, it might be a young one, and the way to tell on some of these hummingbirds, if it's a young one, their new feathers all have this little beige margin on the outer edge. And over time, that wears away, and all you would see is the green to blue-green color, and you would not see that beige and edge on there. So I think this is a young one. Probably female, could be a young male that doesn't have its adult plumage. More salvia azuria, very sage, with a young male anise on there, getting a few of its iridescent hot pink feathers on the side of his neck and above his eye. If it was a female, she would only have a patch of hot pink right here at the throat. No extra feathers on the side or on the top of the head. So that's how we know this is a male that's a young one. A, a, a adult male would have the full head Gorget with all the hot food. Another salvia. This was given to me by a friend. I had not grown this before. Beautiful scarlet color. And it's a little bit different color foliage. It's a grayish green and it's fuzzy. Uh, he described it to me as Velcro like. And quite tall, uh, two and a half, three feet. They really liked it a lot. So a great plant to have. Salvia gregii, one of their absolute favorites, called autumn sage. I don't know exactly why it's called autumn sage because it definitely blooms before that. It, it starts to bloom in July. This particular one called hot lips, they go to all the time. And it's called that because most of the flowers, not all, have a red tips on them and uh, with some white on the top part of the flower. This plant is very robust. I cut this down to four or five six inches every spring, and it grows into a rather enormous plant that's three feet wide and three feet tall. 
but they love it. There are other salvia gregii that are red or hot pink. They love those too. I've had the salmon colored ones. I've had purple. And one time I even found a yellow one, which was beautiful. I loved it. But the hummingbirds were not very interested in those other colors. They really liked the red. That would be a gregii or that hot lip that's red and white. This is a new plant for me. I've heard of this plant before, but I've never grown it. Friend gave this to me. Salvia, oh, Garanitic, yeah, you can see how it's spelled. Anis salvia, I'm not sure why they call it that. It doesn't really smell like anise to me, but definitely a hummingbird attracting plant and gorgeous sky blue flowers, very tall, Easy to see the birds on the plant and it waves around in the wind a little bit. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. And another view of that plant with a different hummingbird on it. Gorgeous sky blue. It's hard to find sky blue flowered plants. There's just not that many and uh, most of them are salvia. But this one they really, really like. And a related one called black and blue with these stunning royal blue flowers. Same growth habit as the light blue ones, Argentine skies. They love it. I was so happy to have these plants that my friend gave me because this was one of the favorite places for the hummingbirds to go and Larry was able to get some really, really wonderful shots this year. Close up of those gorgeous blue flowers and they really are this color. This incredible royal blue. It's amazing. Vauchneria, lovely name, sometimes called hummingbird trumpet. This one is one that does spread a bit. And I have to trim around the clump every spring and take out the plant that's grown out a bit too far for my taste. There are two species that I have. This one on the left here is the Arizonica, which is tall, 24 inches or so, and takes all summer to grow up that tall and blooms in October, late September, all through October. There's probably blooms out there now. I think I took this photo two weeks ago. And then the Californica version species is much shorter and blooms quite a bit earlier. A little more of a, almost I call it a short ground cover that maybe 12 inches high and blooms in the summer and does attract some birds during the summer, summertime. So all of these plants really love full sun and they take the heat really, really well. Most of my plants, not all, but my big long perennial garden is all watered with soaker hose. And I've gone through several iterations of different soaker hoses. I've still not found the ultimate soaker hose yet, but I keep resisting putting on any overhead water on there. I'd much prefer some groundwater. And, and I have a very steep slope on the back property that has a lot of native plants on it, and those have a little bit of drip to some of the plants. The sagebrush there, the rabbit rush, and some of the other natives, they don't get any extra water at all. And the hesperallo that I showed you earlier, the Texas red yucca, also on that steep slope gets no extra water and you is very happy there. Another view of the Zalchinaria, I mean, red trumpet. Beautiful red orange. So a lot of people think that you have to have red plants for your hummingbirds, but that's the only thing they're interested in. And that's true to some degree. Typically their favorite ones are red to pinkish or red orange, but you saw with some of those salvias that they are very happy with blue also. Purple, not so much. Definitely red and some of the blues they're very interested in. I looked through the native plant list for the heritage garden and Going to be truthful here, frankly, none of these plants were listed on there. They, they are not native to this area, but if you are growing a heritage garden, 
it's perfectly fine to have a percentage of your plant be non-native. And if we can check off the drought tolerant box and the pollinator box and the hummingbird box, then those would be great additions to your heritage garden for other reasons besides being native. There were a couple of plants on that list that I haven't grown, but might possibly be attractive, attractive for hummingbirds. And that would be the Western Columbine, which is red. I can't say for sure they are interested in that, but it would make sense. And the Scarlet Gilia, Ipomoxis, I think it's a short-lived plant, but it's definitely red with some trumpet-shaped flowers and also might be an interesting plant for hummingbirds. And both are on the list. And there's also a Western Honeysuckle Vine, don't recall the species, which they might also be interested in. They are generally interested in hummingbird, uh, I'm sorry, uh, honeysuckle vine. And one last photo here of an, a hummingbird, a male rufus with his full gorget showing in the light. And I didn't spend a lot of time talking about this other salvia here on the lower left, the salvia pachyphyla. They, Larry has a few pictures of them going to it, so it does attract them, but I love it. I think it's a fantastic thing. I love the gray green foliage and the flowers are just marvelous. And the, I, I'm going to call it the calyx, the lighter violet looking uh, portion of the flower. It just stays like that even when the actual flower fades away. Very striking, lovely to have in the garden, definitely drought tolerant. And I thought it made a nice combination with this with the Sunbird's lovely throat. So I that's my last slide. And I know I'm uh, done a little bit early here. I would be very, very happy to answer any questions you might have about the hummingbirds themselves or the plants or my experience with some other plants that maybe I didn't put in the shelf. So I am happy to take any kinds of questions. Lisa, that was an amazing presentation. And, and it's so hard when we're virtual because you can't hear us going, ooh, ah, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, There is a little bit of a downside, I guess, to doing a presentation that's not live because as a presenter, you tend to play off of that a little bit. You, you read the signals from the audience of what they're really interested in and you decide whether you're going to talk more about it or not, or quickly move on to another slide because maybe they're not as interested. But, um, I know my husband's photos are marvelous. They, they're fantastic. And I really love my perennial garden a lot. I like sitting on my deck and looking at it and watching the birds. And it's just a fun combination for us. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely breathtaking. And to stand in your yard and to watch the hummingbirds dipping and diving and just the number, the sheer number. You came at a good time when there were quite a few in the yard. I think some of them were migrants going south. The Rufus hummingbirds and the Calliope's were heading south. So you, you came at a good time. Fabulous. Well, we do have several questions, don't we, Miss Alyssa? We do. Yeah, let's kick those off. Um, the first one that came in is, um, there is one Anna's female coming to my feeders and to a neighbor's one mile away. This is the first time they have been in my neighborhood that I know of. I did see three together about two weeks ago. Do they not nest in our area at all? I have a heater for the feeder. As far as I know, there is no direct evidence that they nest here. They definitely nest on the west side in the whole Puget Sound area, all up and down the west coast. And they, they live year round there. I have relatives that live on that side and we've been there at Christmas and New Year's and the hummingbirds are coming to their feeders. And the numbers are definitely increasing here in the mid Columbia region. They are relatively common now in the fall and even all the way all through the entire winter. But as far as I know, no one has actually seen a nest or seen a female on a nest. We saw some breeding activity this year with males that were here in the spring and doing their 
white. They do this, all hummingbirds do this to some degree. They often fly way up high in the air and then shoot down as fast as possible and make this quick turn at the bottom of the curve and make a noise either with their tail feathers or their wing feathers. And they're displaying to a female. Whether or not they actually made it and did, had a nest here, I can't say. But the fact that they're increasing in numbers in this area would not surprise me that if they did start to breed here. And that's a great segue to our next question. Um, for those that do overwinter, what are they eating through the winter? Yes, good question. I believe for the most part, they are depending on people to have a heated feeder. We have one that my husband rigged up with a heat tape, so it's certainly not some fancy thing that you can buy, but it works and it keeps the nectar thawed. And you don't have to think about bringing it in at night and taking it back out and putting out a fresh one in midday when it's so cold that the first one you put out froze. And it's possible that they're also finding some small insect gnats or um, eggs, open eggs or things like that. I can't say for sure, but hummingbirds do eat insects, small ones, for the protein. But they seem to survive just fine over the winter if they have a heated feeder to come to. They need something early in the morning to basically wake themselves up. Hummingbirds have a state of being that's called torpor, and it doesn't have to be cold out for this to happen. They do it at night. When they sleep, their body essentially goes into hibernation. Their heart rate slows way down, their metabolism slows way down, and they are, are barely alive. I don't know exactly what wakes them up in the morning. It might be sunlight, or I uh, can't say for sure, but they do wake up, but they need some energy first thing in the morning. So having a thawed feeder available for them is important. Great, thank you. Um, got a compliment here on the photos and to tell Larry, thank you. Uh -huh. um, and, then our <laughs> and then our next question is, how do you get blue, black and blue salvia to overwinter? I can't answer that question for sure because I this is the first year I've ever grown it. But the friend that gave me those plants, he's had them in his yard for a number of years. And it's possible that some of them are seedlings that he has. I can't say if anybody has had other experience with it. It's my understanding that they can overwinter us, maybe not consistently. If you mulch it, uh, don't cut it down in the fall. Sometimes plants that are marginally hardy tend to survive better if you leave the stems and the old foliage intact over the winter. I don't know if it's just providing a little bit of thermal protection for the, the plant's roots, or you could mulch it with some mulch, uh, bark, or pine needles, something like that, if that helps. I'm just gonna be experimenting this winter and see what happens next spring. I do hope they're there. If they're not, I am willing to actually buy more of those plants and treat them like an animal. But I do hope they survive. Great. And that kind of addressed some of the next question, I think, asking if you can discuss pruning a bit more. Of the perennial plants specifically? That I'm assuming that's what they're um, asking. They don't include that in the question, but I would assume so. Yeah. Okay. I rarely trim down all of my plants in the fall. I, I leave everything intact. I know sometimes it's not the most attractive look in the garden, but overall, I think the, the plants are happier if, like I mentioned before on the previous question, if the plant itself and the root fall and all is protected in a a little bit, at least with some foliage and stem. So I need all of that in place. And I trim everything down in beginning in late February, or early March. Most of these plants, I trim them right down to the ground, except for maybe the salvia gregiis that have the red and pink flowers or the hotlips one. 
trim those to six or eight inches and leave a few hard stems. They have stems that are a little bit like lavender, marginally woody. But for the most part, a lot of these I turn them down to the ground. Some of the penstemons have green leaves year round in the spring. They'll still have a nice map of green leaves. In general, I don't prune things down until spring. Great. Thank you. We're getting a lot, a lot of great questions here, Lisa. Um, this one I was wondering about as well. What kind of soaker hose do you find reliable? <laughs> None. But uh, that was <laughs> part of my comment about I still have not found the ultimate soaker hose yet. Originally, we had the black ones that looked like they're made out of ground up tires. And the ones we had first looked really quite good. I liked them a lot. They lasted a long time. But over time, they eventually started to wear out from probably ultraviolet light and just changes in temperature and bright sun and all of that. And they sprung a few leaks. So I bought different ones, new ones of the same type. Not very good quality at all. They were constantly springing leaks and shooting up sprays of water. And then I tried some that were like fabric with a seam on one side and supposedly the water was just supposed to leak out the seam side and again some some parts of it just put out way too much water and sometimes the, there was a break in the seam or something and water was shooting out so i wish i could say that i have the perfect filter hose but i don't so i, I guess i'll keep working on that i thought about possibly putting out some rip line that the hose itself has just has some small holes in it. I haven't tried that before, but it might be worth looking into. Great. Um, what methods do you use to keep cats out of your yard? <laughs> That's a, a good question. I have a friend who has really a problem with cats coming in her yard a lot and digging around. And she's also a bird enthusiast and does not want the cats in her yard. We do have cats that come and go, but I've never had a problem with them digging and using my garden as a litter box. So I don't have a great suggestion for you other than maybe laying down some, there's some mats you can buy that have little spikes on them or burying some chicken wire in some of the open areas where they like to dig, uh, placing some rocks. They won't dig in rocks. You could lay, lay some like river rocks and some, they probably have a few places that they prefer to go if the soil's loose. Uh, they probably won't dig in bark, but I can't say for sure. And unfortunately for the cats, we have a lot of coyotes in our area here, and when we see it, a cat in the yard, whether it belongs to somebody in the neighborhood or it's a feral cat, we only see it a few times and then we never see it again. And I wish I could get across to people who own these cats and let them out that their cat is going to disappear and then never going to see it again because it's a coyote. And, and it's so much better for the birds if pet cats are kept indoors. How about, um, are most of these plants also deer and elk resistant? That's a great question. Yes, because most of them are very aromatic. The foliage and the flowers to some extent are, I mean, I like the smell of them, but mints and salvias and, uh, Maybe not the penstemon so much, but definitely the mints and the salvia, they won't eat those unless they're really, really hungry. And we do have deer that live out behind our house in uh, the park called the e. Johnson Park. And there are quite a few of them down there. And this is the first summer when I've noticed them actually coming up into our yard. And I don't really know why. Maybe it was so hot and dry, I'm not sure. And the plant that they ate was that cupia. The firecracker plant and at first I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it because it was like stripped of leaves and flowers and just the stems were left and I'm pretty sure it was from here. But in general 
the, the plants that smell aromatic to you when you crush the leaves or rub the leaves and smell, see what it smells like, if it's pretty potent smelling, then generally the deer are going to leave it alone. Ooh, that's a great tip. Next question is two questions. Um, do you have buckwheat? And what do the hummers think of that? And two, what about native bees? I have recently become very, very interested and enamored with bees and flies and wasps. And um, I would have to say it's bordering on an obsession with me. Always out there taking pictures of them and I post them to iNaturalist. Very fun, and my eyes have been opened quite a bit to what plants these pollinators really, really, really like, and snow buckwheat for sure, and rabbit brush, either gray or green. Absolutely perfect pollinator attractors. And I've gone to the native plant demonstration garden at Hanson Park many, many times that Heather uh, turns me on to, and also, those plants, they're plentiful there, and there are all kinds of pollinators there. I've never seen a hummingbird go to them. And it's probably the nature of the shape of the flowers themselves that they can't utilize the nectar that's in there. And it's also possible that these pollinators are actually gathering the pollen itself and not necessarily eating the nectar. They're gathering the pollen, take it back, for their larvae to eat. So there, I know there are a lot of other native plants that attract pollinators too, but I think if it attracts hummingbirds, it's probably gonna attract pollinators, insects. But just because it attracts insects does not necessarily mean it's going to attract hummingbirds. It doesn't always go back and forth. Great, thank you. Um, on this one, we got someone sharing some information that heat, heated hummingbird feeders are readily available, including at the Yakima Arboretum. And then a question on that, if we get heated feeders for the first time in the winter, any advice for getting Hummer's attention to visit? My guess is that any heated hummingbird feeder you buy is going to have something red on it. There's going to be some portion of it that's red plastic, I would guess, and that's all it takes. They really truly are attracted to red things, and that's where they'll check things out first. Even if you're wearing clothes that have red flowers on them, they'll come and see what, what you've got to offer. So you don't have to put any red food coloring in the nectar at all. In fact, it's better if you don't. All they need is a little bit of red on the feeder itself. I suppose you could put some red ribbon or red cloth where you're going to hang your hummingbird feeder, at least to get them to come and investigate, and then they'll find the feeder. That's uh, an option because for most people in this area, we're probably not going to have some red flowers available in the middle of the winter. Maybe a few, but not enough that's going to truly affect them. It's going to be the feeder itself with the red on it. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Heather, I know we're getting close to the end of our time here. There's so many great um, questions and input in here. We have one question on wanting to print the materials um, used for the presentation. Um, didn't see a link, but would love to have these planting suggestions. Yes, and we are going to, Lisa has done a phenomenal list for us. We were hoping to be able to share it directly uh, through a link, but we're uh, not able to do that. So what you're going to get from me next week. And uh, so be sure to check your spam folder just in case I go to spam. But by Wednesday, you're going to get an email from Heather Wendt at conservelaw.net. And that um, email will contain uh, the plant list that Lisa so kindly put together with us with the common name and the scientific name of the plants, uh, as well as a link to this presentation. So look for that email midweek. And uh, and we'll also post, of course, on the Heritage Garden uh, website as well. Excellent. Very good. Well, I think, um, folks, thank you great 
for all of the wonderful comments and questions for Lisa and the great interaction. Um, Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your passion. You're welcome. It was very enjoyable. I, I enjoyed putting this slideshow together and I love talking about plants and birds. So yeah, it was fun. Yes, and thank your husband again for sharing his beautiful photography as well. We, we really, really appreciate it. I will tell him. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right. Oh my gosh, what a phenomenal presentation. I, 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 there are plants now, obviously I'm going to go out and buy. <laughs> I think we're all gonna be sort of, uh, you know, uh, redoing our Christmas shopping wish lists here uh, with some <laughs> of uh, Lisa's great information. Absolutely. Um, right, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So our next speaker, we'll go ahead and move into our next speaker before we take a break. I think that's what our schedule is. Um, so our yeah. next speaker is Al Murphy. And Al is a retired forester. He is a current master gardener, and he has over 20 years of experience providing technical fire management assistance to landowners. And today he is going to share with us uh, information on creating beautiful, safe, and firewise landscapes. So we are very excited to have Al joining us this morning. Welcome, Al. Thank you. I will put up the uh, screen here real quick, and we'll jump into it, if that's okay. Is, do you see the screen and hear me okay? We do. Wonderful. Well, I, I thank you very much, uh, Heather and Lisa, for, or Elisa, for getting me uh, started here. And I guess we'll jump right into it. I think that was an outstanding presentation uh, that we just heard about uh, creating habitat for uh, hummingbirds and what have you. So what I wanna talk about today is having native plants that are fire resistant, but also serve a lot of other purposes. I wanna save water, save homes, enrich habitat and reduce maintenance. That's the kind of things I don't look at a plant to just do one thing. I look at it as an opportunity to do a multitude of things. Uh, so we're gonna kind of jump into that right off the bat. And oops, okay. Are we still on okay there? Yep, we are good to go. Okay, I just messed up something here. And uh, I lost, there we go. Is, is, uh, too many clicks on the computer on the uh, on the mouse is so what I wanted to talk about was was share information on plants that are native they're firewise and I and I want to create beautiful landscapes around a home and and make sure that everybody understands that is that firewise fire resistant vegetation around a home doesn't mean a uh, a dozer line uh, down to bare dirt around a home. On the contrary, it means having a beautiful landscape and and accomplishing a large variety of uh, objectives. So speaking of objectives is what I'd like to do is I have four objectives, if you will. I hope you learn something new. I hope you have fun doing it. I, I Something I learned a few years ago, when somebody learns something new for the first time, uh, this is a rhetorical question here, but uh, how many, what percent do you think people retain when they hear something for the first time? It, it, it's 2%, okay? 2% when you first hear a topic uh, that you're not familiar with for the first time, you retain about 2%. But you know what? If you make that enjoyable and fun and a uh, interesting learning experience, you can double or triple the retention level. So that's why I kind of like to get the idea of having fun with it. That my third objective is don't get hurt. If you if I say something that is not clear, I don't want you to do heavy lifting and try to hurt your brain trying to think about it. Throw it in as a question and, and challenge me. And I can do the heavy lifting to make sure you don't get hurt, but you learn something, okay? Then the other thing I want to do is, is I want to talk about things in a manner that uh, may seem disconnected at first, 
but I want to bring them all together. You ever heard, well, now let's connect the dots. Well, before you can connect dots, you have to have dots. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put dots around at different places. And then as we move down the path, we're going to start collect, uh, connecting those dots. And, and I'm going to have some breaks throughout here where there's an opportunity to ask me questions. If you have questions, if not, we'll just move on. So I hope that makes sense. And that's kind of where we're headed. But before we get started, I thought maybe there's a couple of definitions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I know you guys can read better than I can. So I'm not going to read you these. But I just want to share with you, but native plants, are they're, they're natural to the area. They're indigenous. They're part of the area. They've been here ever since the glacier left or the volcano erupted or whatever it was. They're the things that grow here and they are adapted to the environment. Naturalized plants, on the contrary, are plants that were introduced, brought in by somebody. In fact, I, I would be willing to bet almost everybody's familiar with dandelions, aren't you? Is dandelions are a naturalized plant. And, and I learned this not too long ago. They came over on the first ship. They came over on the Mayflower with the pilgrims. And they brought those with them in case there wasn't anything good here to eat that could always eat dandelions. And I'm quite confident that you probably know dandelions are doing quite well in North America. Um, another definition, xeric or xeriscape, uh, just means it doesn't take a lot of water. And, and this is a relative term, by the way, is, is when you live in an environment, um, let's say some places in India, for example, where they get 30 feet of rain a year, highest rainfall on earth is something like 30 feet. Uh, they don't get it in one day, but sometimes they do. Is, is Zarek over there is very different from what Zarek may, may mean in central Washington. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. So Zarek doesn't mean no water, but it doesn't mean a lot of water relative to the type of biome that you live in. And, and diversity, uh, biodiversity. We hear a lot about biodiversity. People use it, it seems like, almost every day. And biodiversity just means a large uh, collection of different living organisms as well as non-living non living things. Abiotic, which is non-living, and biotic, which is living. So that's that's what diversity, biodiversity means. Uh, another thing that, that gets thrown around a lot is definitions of fire resistant and fire resilient, tolerant and adapted. Those all mean slightly different things. I'm gonna be talking mostly about fire resistance, okay? And those are plants that have the ability to take a lot of heat before they catch on fire. And I think you all know that anything, uh, any organic compound will burn given enough heat. So there is no such thing as a fireproof plant, but there are fire resistant plants. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Fire resilient, they resist damage. They have certain protective mechanisms or something about them. And, and they uh, res are resilient when there is a fire. And, and sometimes it's a very uh, strange operation, and we'll get into that also a little bit more. Fire tolerant means that they can withstand heat, that they are built in such a manner that they can withstand. Fire adapted means they grew up in a fire environment. Many, almost all the plants in central, almost all the native plants in, in central Oregon are fire adapted species. And if there's any questions on that later, you can break those down and we can address those. Then another thing that I think is kind of uh, just this, I think this is my last slide on definitions, a shrub. It's a, it's a woody plant with several stems versus a tree, which is a woody plant with a single stem, just a bowl. It's called a bowl, B-O-L-E, coming up. That's what, that's what a tree is versus a, a, uh, a shrub has got a bunch of different uh, stems arising at the ground. And a step. Sage step, we use that term quite a bit. I hear it frequently. It's just a generally a flat area, a, a grassy area with very few trees. Okay. The ones we have around here are made up of bunch grasses, and I'll talk about that more. Uh, and they have uh, forbs growing up between those uh, bunches throughout the uh, throughout the uh, environment. So I, I hope that's enough 
definitions. Now, one of the things that I think is very important on, on if you will, creating a, a base to start from, the geology and geography of central Washington is very, very different than a lot of areas. In fact, I've often heard it called as a Disneyland for geologists and geographers because there's so many different things going on. Think about it, but from the crest of the Cascades out to the uh, Sage Step is not very far, but you have gone through a huge array of bio, different living areas, biomes. Okay, if you're up, uh, in fact, the way, think about it. The, the, geolo the geology of the Cascades is, is uh, a couple of continental plates running into each other, lifting the mountains, causing volcanoes and all that kind of good stuff. Very, very different uh, geology in that part of the geography. Then you go out on the Columbia Basin, you got three mile thick uh, German chocolate cake. It's all basalt, three miles in some places, thick with just basalt rock. So, and in that, in fact, let's talk about that just a second, is the geology and geography of the area determines the climate, right? On the west side, we got a lot of rain. On the east side, not so much. So the climate, along with the geology, helps determine the soils. And if you think about that also, is the soils and the climate determine the plants that grow in an area, okay? The plants, along with the climate and the geology and geography, determine the critters, the animals that live in the area. So this is all the study of ecology, interactions, interrelationships, a different thing. So as we look at the uh, east side of the Cascades, we start up on the crest, if you will, with a mixed conifer type. Mix, and I'll get into, I'll show you some slides here. And then we drop down, it's not quite as moist. We'd get into the dry forest and then out into the sage step. So, and we're gonna look at a, some slides and I'll talk about that a bit, little bit more. A way to remember, by the way, the geology and geography is geology, it really rocks, man. You need to be hip on this, geology rocks. However, geography is where it's at, dude. So anyway, that's a way to remember that. So let's talk about starting up by the crest of the Cascades. We got a mixed conifer stand, okay? And, and this is where I'm gonna talk about moisture regimes and what's xeric in one area, maybe a water hog in another area. So if we're up close to the crest of the Cascades on the east side, we got a mixed conifer. We may have uh, ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, grand fir, larch, lots of different trees. And, and trees that take a fair amount of moisture, maybe an average, an average. By the way, there, there's no such thing as an absolute as far as moisture regimes are concerned, but say up 30 plus inches of rain of uh, moisture per year. I, won't, I shouldn't say rain, moisture per year. And then we drop down somewhat and we drop into the dry forest. Primary species uh, under a natural regime was, was ponderosa pine with a scattering of dug fir. But, uh, and so now we're dropping down to maybe a maximum of 20 inches of rain a year. And we change, again, the total vegetation mix changes a bunch as it's tied to the moisture regime and also to the soils, if you will. Then we drop down a little further. In fact, I didn't introduce this, but now uh, I will, is we're not quite in the dry, dry forest and we're not quite in the shrub step yet. We got an ecotone. An ecotone is a transition area from one biome to another. So, so we, we have a lot of this in, in central Oregon where we're coming down off the mountain. In fact, a lot of places, it's not too far from the Columbia River where we got an area, we still got some ponderosa pine and scattered trees out through, but we got uh, sagebrush, bitterbrush, rabbit brush, lots of different things. So it's an ecotone. It's, an, it's not one and it's not the other, but it's halfway in between. The, then we drop out, <laughs> drop out move out into the sage step where the primary shrub out there is, is uh, sagebrush, bitterbrush, rabbit brush. There's several different species of rabbit brush. But, and then it's an understory under a natural regime of uh, pretty much blue bunch wheat grass and some fescues and, and a variety of forbs, okay? 
So that, that's how our regime moves down from the crest of the Cascades out into the Columbia Basin, the, the more flat land out through there. So we, we've got a huge soil and moisture regime that shifts from one end to the other end. Okay. So in those, what I'm going to be talking about through here are, are the different categories of plants. The the and I, for the lack of a better term, I'm calling them categories: trees, shrubs, grasses, and forbs. It, it, this came up, by the way, herbaceous, perennial, and annual plants. Okay, forbs or uh, flowers is is what generally uh, that's what that's what we call forbs, if you will. I, most people know that. By definition, a perennial, herbaceous perennial, all the above ground material dies on an annual basis and then restarts from the roots versus an annual where it has, grows from a seed at the beginning of the season, goes through a complete maturity and then dies and then starts over from seed the following year. So think about that from a perennial, herbaceous perennial standpoint, Everything above ground dies, okay? There were some questions asked on the, in the last presentation about the, there's certain areas, the natives around here are used, they're, they're accustomed, they're indigenous to the area, so they adapted to the harshest types of environment temperatures that we may have. However, if we get into some natives, or uh, if you will, adaptive uh, naturalized plants, they're not native and and they may take some additional uh mulching over the top of them to keep them alive keep their root system alive and just, i'll say one more thing about that uh is as a, as a plant prepares an herbaceous perennial prepares for the winter to come on it pumps down a lot of carbohydrates into the root system so that it is able to store carbohydrates so that when when it's time for that particular plant to grow it releases those carbohydrates and it's that's what reproduces uh gets the growing going in the springtime or whenever it happens to be right for that plant to uh start putting on this year's growth so I'm just going to stop there just for a minute and see if there's any questions about what I covered so far. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions, make sure that we're all in the same spot, making sure that that set of dots made some sense. So, uh, like I say, I'd be happy to uh, see if there's any questions. Uh, oh, Elisa, if there's anything. I'm there's not. Any yeah, I'm not seeing any questions yet, Al. Just a reminder to folks, uh, feel free. as um, questions occur to you, uh, enter those into that questions box and we can send them Al's way, but nothing, nothing yet. Wonderful. That means I'm saying everything perfectly clear. Not. Yes, there you go. <laughs> well, we, do have a, we do have a hand raised, Cindy uh, Fazio. Are we able to unmute, Cindy? Um, yes, we should be able to. Cindy, Cindy it looks ready. like yourself muted. So if you look in the attendees list next to your name to the left or in that smaller control panel, which is a dark gray, go ahead and unmute yourself on that. And I know she was having some sound issues. So if you're still having some sound oh. issues, you can also uh, type your question in the questions box. Yes. And you can also call in under the audio menu. Um, you can also use your phone, which helps clear up sound issues for some people. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if we set up under a webinar, I'm not sure the attendees can talk. Uh, if we were just in a web meeting, they would be able to talk, but, but I'm not sure about a webinar. Yeah, we, they are able to, but it looks okay. like we're having some issues with the muting, though she did enter the question into the questions box here. What is the max moisture for step for for step for shrub step yes what's the, oh, what's oh. The shrub step? okay yeah. i i get I, i'm sorry i didn't get into that i i uh the max moisture for a shrub step is, is i'm not sure there is well there is a max it, it's it's a combination of soils and moisture 
is is but a typical shrub step is somewhere around nine inches of moisture per year and it and it can go probably up to 15 or almost to 20 inches of rain a year moisture i shouldn't say rain because it's snow as well as rain so i would say uh some really high quality if you will high quality giant sage may go up as far as 20, close to 20 inches of rain there is no absolute so, but it could range from say 20 all the way down to say around five, something like that. And, and have a, there's no one set magic number. And it can, some shrubs can last for several years under a severe stress condition and come back. So one year we may get a lot of moisture and then for three or four years, five years after, we may not, but they can hang on until they get that one time heavy moisture again. So I would say nine for an average, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, once you get below eight, theoretically, you're into a desert environment. Now, theoretically, that's not 100% true. I would say there is no set number for moisture for anything anymore with a lot of changes that are going on. As I said, you know, the, there's a lot of things that determine what will grow in an area, but soil, climate and moisture are the things that really make that determination. So it's not just one set of things. If you have a beautiful soil, a nice loamy type of soil, something can live for a, a much longer period of time than if it was just a, uh, a, a sandy soil, for example, under a drought condition. It's always, a plant would always be stressed almost in those conditions. Does that make sense? I think so. Thanks, Al. We got another question that came in. Um, do you have a good resource for where folks can find out what area they are in? Um, this um, person who's asking thinks they're in a shrub dry forest ecotone, eco but they're not sure. Is there a good resource out there for where we can determine, or is it more kind of taking a look at the landscape? Well, it's more taking a look at the landscape. It's take, like I say, there's not just one thing that's going to determine what your uh, environment is but i but you can look at the plants and, and it'd be a long time here talking about it but is is uh you look at the types of plants that are growing in a dry forest and we'll get more into that here in a second and and then you look at the plants that are growing in a shrub step what do you got the most of you know and, and if you're an equal balance between the two you know for example if you may have some pine grass growing with your sagebrush uh you know that's that's a challenge to figure out what you're in. But let me let me offer one other thought is there are 35 unique species of sagebrush. OK, so sagebrush is not sagebrush. Uh, the most common one we have around here is uh, Artemisia tridentata, if you will, is, is uh, Wyoming big sage is what it's called. And, and that's probably the most common. But we have other sages, stiff sage, black sage that take a lot less moisture. And so you look at the plants just by themselves, it doesn't help you. You need to look at a variety, a collection of uh, indicators to help you figure out just where you're at. Any other questions? No, nope, looks like we got through them all. Okay, we'll just move on then. Thank you for those questions, by the way. So now I wanna kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about the attributes of uh, resistant vegetation, fire resistant vegetation, is every one of these attributes actually has a physics behind it of why it creates, uh, why it is a, uh, a fire resistant vegetation. Rather than looking at specific species and say this one is a uh, fire resistant piece of vegetation, we can do that. But when you start categorizing each plant you often run into exceptions to everything, right? In nature, there are exceptions. In fact, in nature, there's a great quote, by the way, it's easy to remember. In nature, there's no goods, no bads, just consequences. That was a poem I had to memorize and I did good at it in high school. Um, plants, they're low growing. That they're, These are the attributes, low growing plants. The reason that's an attribute is because it doesn't get the wind. It doesn't get an infusion of oxygen and oxygen is necessary for a fire to continue to burn. It's got open configuration. One of the key things about 
uh, keeping a fire going is if you ever try to write light one piece of material, uh, like a piece of wood, it's very challenging to do that. But if you uh, bring stuff, a number of things closer together, it, it's easier to light. And th think about this when you wear a pair of gloves. When it's very, very, very cold outside, wearing gloves is your hands, your fingers are far apart. They're open. It's an open configuration. But when it's very cold outside and you wear mittens, mittens keep your hands a lot warmer, right? Because you radiant heat from one area, one finger to another finger. The same is true in a plant configuration. It's If it's tight, it's wearing gloves. Or excuse me, wearing mittens. But if it's open, it's wearing gloves. I hope that makes sense. I, I hope no uh, uh, metaphors ever work 100% of the time. So um, I just made that up. Is, is high moisture content, succulent parts. Obviously, if it's got moisture in there, it's going to be harder. You got to drive the moisture off before combustion can occur. So that makes sense. Uh, similar is water-like sap rather than a sticky, pitchy sap is the pitchy sap is actually flammable, whereas the chemical content of the water-like sap is not combustible. Broad leaves, it, the, you know, if you have nice big leaves like that, they have in physics terms, they have a, a high, uh, or excuse me, a low surface to volume ratio. So that means there's a lot of mass inside there and it takes a lot of heat to get it going before it'll catch on fire. Herbaceous plants, part plant, plant parts, again, herbaceous material has a lot more moisture than woody material. So it, it takes a lot more heat to get it to burn. And a low accumulation of dead material, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but dead material has a lower moisture content than live material. Tight bark is, for example, if you take a, a big cedar tree, for example, it's got a lot of loose bark on it. And so it's a, got a lot of small pieces. But if you take a piece of young maple, it's got a tight bark and there's no way that extra oxygen can get in. there. So those are some attributes. And that's the way to be looking at plants as whether or not they're fire resistant or not. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Here's another way to look at it fire resistant versus fire prone, short versus tall. That it, it doesn't get as much. You can read those just as well as I can, but deciduous versus evergreen. There's a lot of chemical difference in deciduous trees versus evergreen trees. Evergreen trees have a chemical, a number of chemicals, oleoresins and other things that are easily uh, combustible by themselves versus deciduous, which is more watery type of thing. Um, spread out, dense, okay, loose bark, that's probably enough. We'll just move on from there. Here's something I wanna shift. Now we're getting another dot. I wanna talk about this for a second, something. The home ignition zone. A fellow named Jack Cohen, uh, somebody that was working for the uh, Missoula Fire Lab, did some studies up in uh, the Northwest Territories. And what he did, he ran crown fires, you know, the, the hottest fires you can th that exist in nature. He'd run those up against buildings and see uh, how far away he had to have these buildings uh, in order that they would not burn, okay? And, and it was kind of interesting, he, and he found that if you had 100 feet between the most intense wildfire and a wooden structure, it will not catch on fire. And that, that's an important finding, by the way. That was either on flat ground or 20% slope, by the way. But once you get up into steeper slope, that 100 feet increases in distance. So you need to move that out because other factors start to uh, play in there. So we'll get into that just a little bit more here. So there's something that, you know, if you can keep a fire, the highest intensity, at least 100 feet from a building, it's got better than a 90% chance of surviving a fire. Now, you need to do some additional stuff with that, I, So, and we'll talk about that. And, and one of the interesting things is who owns that land around the building? And, and uh, you know, that's a rhetorical question again, is, is 
99% of the time, that's private land. And almost nobody other than the landowner, homeowner, has the authority to do anything on that land. So I just throw out another thing. While land agencies are trained to do catch a fire, a wildland fire by doing perimeter control. They work on the outside of the fire and try to control it from the perimeter, if you will. Structural fire departments, you know, the, the city fire departments, they're trained to put houses, the inside of a house out. The fire is generally within the home. And so there is a gap, if you will, a responsibility gap on who's got the right type of control and the right type of training on that. And that is a gap that's existed for a long period of time. The other one that I think is that we have never assumed as landowners and homeowners that it's our responsibility before the fire starts to take the proper action to reduce the probability of our home burning. Um, you know, we, we do that on a number of different things. Let me show you a diagram of this home ignition zone, if you will. If this whole area, uh, let me grab a, uh, oh, no, I don't want a highlighter. I want to lay, this whole area out here would be considered the home ignition zone. And you can break it down into three different landscape zones. And they're all a set distance away from the home is what you can do is you can have a low intensity fire out here and that would be your objective out in this zone three which is 30 to 100 feet from a home and in this landscape zone two for example which is five to 30 feet from a home you'd want you can have stuff out there that burns but you don't want it to be able to spread and then right close to the house this area right around the house five feet 10 feet, some people call, but I'll, I'll get into that a little more, is your objective there is don't have anything that's burnable, no ignition. So you could have these three different landscape zones and you've got objectives for each one of those. Now with that, we can actually have some vegetation uh, objectives, you know, and we can look at different types of vegetation we can put in those zones that's in harmony with nature, is in harmony with the fire, with all, lots of different things. So I, I already explained this within the basically non-flammable materials. And, and I'll talk about that here in a second is the 30 feet. We want well spaced, pruned up green and no dead fuels in this area. We call it lean, clean and green lean. We don't want a lot of stuff in there clean. We don't want dead material and green. We want it with a fair moisture content during the fire season. And then once we get out, 30 feet from the home, we want well-spaced and native, natural fuels. Vegetation is another word for that. It is pruned up so nothing can get into the crowns and, and all the natives that you can think of are, are just fine in that area. Okay, um, in zone one, for example, oh, uh, before I get into that, I wanna talk about uh, the categories of vegetation that best fit I want to talk about this from the standpoint, there is no such thing as perfection. Per, this is, I'm going to give you the perfect, but everything is not going to be that way. In nature, in natural uh, people, none of us are perfection. perfect. Uh, we may strive for that, but we'll never achieve it. We can always do a little better. And the same thing is true with landscapes, is we're looking for excellence. And excellence is defined as the best you can do with the resources that you have, whether that be money, energy, or knowledge, okay? So you're doing the best you can. And, and there's always going to be something that's uh, preventing you from being perfect. I'll give you an example. I, I said landscape zone one is uh, five feet from the house, zero to five feet from the house. Is is a, I tied in with a, a woman, a good friend of mine, uh, and, and she's got this tree growing up right next to her house. It, it's dangerous from the standpoint of that it could tip over and land on the house, but it's still fairly young for uh, a conifer. But it, she planted it, or actually her husband planted it the day her daughter was born. And she says, there's no way in heck I'm going to cut that tree down. That's, that's a beautiful tree. 
I said, okay, well, there's some things that we can do to that tree, prune it so that the limbs are above the roof line, for example. And that way, if the limbs catch on fire, the heat is already going to be above the roof line. So the amount of energy heat put down on the home is very low. Most of the, as you all know, heat rises, right? And so it's going to go up. It's still a risk. However, we've reduced it somewhat by limiting it up a long way. So there's an example of, of a, an exception to the rule, if you will. So we're looking for the, the idea of having excellence and not perfection. Okay, so ideally in, in the uh, zone one right around a home, as far as vegetation is concerned, you want to have ground covers, plants that don't get very high off the ground, herbaceous perennials and annuals, the, the forbs that we're going to talk about a little bit more, herbaceous vines, okay, they're great, and turf grasses, as well as uh, rocks, and I should talk about those, and I will, if we have time, talk about rock mulches. Um, and they, they are outstanding, I believe. So in, in that area within uh, vegetation, five to 10 feet from the home, the idea is try to manage ignitions. You don't want stuff to catch on fires. So you don't want trees or shrubs. Oops, that should be or. Uh, and no organic mulches. You can use rock mulches. There's lots of different rock. Is is uh, If you like different colors, then I can tell you that you know, if you like red rock, you can use the uh, cinders, a uh, technical name for that, a scoria. You can use cinders. They can come in either uh, red or gray. If you like uh, white, you can use granites or limestones. If you like black, you can use uh, basalts or other types of igneous rock. So there's lots of ways to do that without using organic mulch right up close to your house. You want low flammable plants, okay? And we talked about those. And inorganic mulches, which I just mentioned. Forbs and wildflowers. Now we're gonna get into some specifics here. Is, is they all grow, they have a niche, if you will. Most of in the shrub step area specifically, we've got bunch grasses out through there and, and we'll get into those here. And, and But in between them, we got lots of pretty flowers that grow. If you've ever been out in the spring, you'll notice that there is a lot of flowers in the shrub step area. There's lots of flowers in the dry forest. You get up into the uh, um, mixed conifer, not so much. Uh, and, and we get a different regime up there. But in those, you know, they provide a tremendous amount of beneficial insect habitat that we don't have to be uh, chasing them away because 99% of the insects that live around native vegetation are beneficial to us. They're not the ones that are introduced that we often have to treat for. Birds, I, the previous presentation talked about that. I, uh, there's lots of different birds that do tremendous job and are attracted to native vegetation and small critters and, and big critters even. And, and, we could get into that if there's some questions on it. And they provide foods and medicines uh, and frequently did for a long, long period of time to the Native Americans. So uh, here's what I thought I would do on this. I would try to throw out an example of a few, uh, few types of plants. In penstemons, for example, there are probably 30 different species of penstemon that live in and around this area. And depending on where you live, if you're down on the sage step or you're up in the mixed conifer type, there is a number of different penstemons. Um, and I hate to get into, well, I can't get into all the different species of those, but just to get you to thinking about that. Lupin is one, I, I spend a little bit of time talking about that, a very common plant. And it, it's got a large, uh, range of uh, viability in the different systems. In fact, I would be willing to bet that I think lupin grows in every one of our uh, four systems that I've mentioned here. Well, it does. I know it does. Lupin is a species that doesn't take a lot of moisture to keep it green all season long. Drip irrigation is something that uh, our previous speaker talked about, uh, soaker hoses. 
I am a big fan of drip irrigation, and it doesn't take a lot of drip to keep a plant going for a very, very long period of time. Lupin is something that has the, the uh, these green leaves here have somewhere between 250 and almost 400% moisture content. What that means from a fire standpoint, that they won't burn. Then when they do dry out, since the moisture content is so high that there is almost nothing left, there is very little material, fuel material left after it dries out. Have you ever gone out and looked at where the lupin was growing and see what's left? There's not a lot left. It, so there's not a lot of fuel after it dries out. But it doesn't take a lot of moisture to keep it green for a very, very long period of time throughout the growing season. Uh, columbine and strawberry is, is uh, Lisa mentioned the columbine as being a, a great uh, hummingbird plant. And it's a it's a beautiful plant. It, it, it's one of the prettiest plants that we got around here. Uh, strawberry is is another one, a great pollinator. If you were the almost every one of these natives is a great pollinator. I, I don't know if I need to say that, but this is a plant that may grow uh, at, at the most up to about maybe three to four inches high and offers a nice ground cover for uh, uh, select area. And it doesn't take hardly much moisture at all to get it going. Uh, here's another plant, yarrow and phlox. Phlox, probably all seen that. It's one of the first plants to come up in the sage step in the spring. Uh, yarrow is one that always tells a great story, and a lot of people uh, don't look at this from a favorable standpoint, but it's a neat plant because out on the sage step, it can tell you a story. It can tell you how good the range condition is. It's called an increaser-decreaser in a technical term. If your, if your ecosystem is very healthy, you will not see very much yarrow in the system. You'll see an occasional plant, but then as the system starts, the system, when I, the grasses and the uh, uh, land starts to deteriorate, the amount of yarrow increases immensely. And so it, it curves up the abundance of yarrow uh, becomes more and more prevalent throughout the site. Then it finally gets to a point where it said, oh man, this is so trashed out. Then it starts to crash down and goes down. And I don't know if it ever disappears, but it becomes less abundant. Then as conditions start to heal, you'll see it increase for a while. And then it, once it gets healthy again, it decreases again and becomes. So it, it, it's a plant that tells you a story. And it's kind of neat from that perspective. Uh, a couple other ones, uh, Clarkia, which is again an early season, and and uh, fireweed. Fireweed is an annual that uh, comes up. It's a pretty plant. It stays for a long period of time. And by the way, once you see it start to flower up here, and these start to uh, 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 seed out down below, because what happens is the uh, the plant flower chases up the stem, if you will. Once this starts flowers out and this is all, you're two weeks away from snow. That's the old uh, uh, traditional call, by the way. I, I, I'm not sure that's a scientific fact, though. Okay, a couple other ones that, uh, uh, bitterroot. Is this is a, a nice plant that grows in some of the most, it, it's gotta be a harsh site for this to grow. Uh, in fact, bitterroot's an interesting one. The uh, Native Americans have two different names for the same species, okay? In the spring, this is a food, and they dig it up, and, and they would eat it. Later on in the summer, as it cured out, it became a medicine, and they didn't eat it, and the name changed, which I think is kind of interesting. So in the spring, it's one name. In the summer, it's another name it, because it's used for a different purpose. Uh, Lisa mentioned scar scarlet gilia. Scarlet gilia is a plant that stays in a flowering state, can stay in a flowering state for a long period of time by just keeping a little bit of moisture on it, just a little bit. And it'll stay in a flowering state for a very, very long period of time. So anyway, that's these are the types of plants 
that grow very well in this area, this landscape zone one. Now, you can have them out in all three, but, you know, have a predominance of those types of plants in this area around here. I'm hoping that makes sense. So now we're going to get into some native grasses and talk about their root systems and, and their uh, water yields. Most all of the plants around here are bunch grass. Well, that's not 100% true, but more true than false. What happened? Okay. Um, here's a couple of grasses that are pretty fire resistant, fire resilient, and definitely fire adapted. Talk about Sandberg's bluegrass. It, it, it's, a, it's a bunch grass, and it's obviously a native. It only grows the main, you know, this area here where probably uh, 60 to 80 percent of the vegetative matter and mass is down here, only grows to maybe six inches at the most. And the, these uh, seed stalks and seed stems, flowering stems, if you will, may get up to maybe a foot, but not very, very often get that high. And by the way, another thing about uh, Sandberg's bluegrass, the more it's stressed, the more it puts out seed heads. If it's not stressed, it doesn't put out seed heads. Now that kind of makes sense if you think about it, because if every, everything is happy, it doesn't need to reproduce. But if things don't look so good, it puts out seed heads and produces additional seed. So that's a, a neat adapt, adaptation to both fire after a fire uh, sandberg bluegrass stand will be just a mass of of uh, seed heads uh, and, and it's kind of neat but if it's uh, an area that hasn't burned for quite a while you will notice that there's not a lot of seed heads on it i'm not saying there's none but there's just not as many uh, idaho fescue is another one that's uh, uh, a good fire adapted species it's a little taller it'll probably go up to 14 to 18 inches tall but a lot of the matter is down low. Now this one is not, uh, this is an old plant, I can tell by the way it's uh, sitting up here. A couple of good grasses. This one is used great as, uh, if you will, in cheatgrass areas. Uh, I'm working with some folks uh, on rehabilitation of some cheatgrass stands. Uh, just throw out a piece of information here that cheatgrass can burn with a 20 to 30 foot flame length. And flame length is a function of how much heat is being released from the fire. So you can put this uh, blue bunch wheatgrass in there and change the area from a cheatgrass to a blue bunch stand and drop the flame from a uh, 20 foot flame length down to about a three to four foot flame length. So it's much easier to catch. It, it'll burn um, and carry a fire but it, at a much lower intensity and it's much easier to catch. Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, a couple of other, why is that not coming back into focus? Uh, sand drop seed and prairie june grass are a couple other species that are both fire adapted and uh, fire wise, or fire resilient, I should say. And these are easy to keep green for most of the season, as with the last two that I talked about, with just a little bit of drip irrigation on them, very little irrigation. Uh, this next one here is blue bunch wheatgrass and uh, this basin wild rye, two entirely different types of plant, but in the same uh, system. This is probably the most common grass that we got out on the sage step. Uh, well, it was the most common grass in an area that's hit hard by overgrazing or something to that effect. It disappears and is replaced by the cheatgrass, which is a non-native introduced species. But this is a species that can be planted and it comes back rather well. It's not terribly challenging to get it going again, but it takes a little moisture to keep it, to get it started and help it get going. And it doesn't hurt to do some weed, weed whacking, you know, uh, a string trimmer on these as they cure out in the uh, late summer. Uh, Basin wild rye is something that it, it'll get up to uh, a good healthy plant. This can be four to five feet tall and a nice big plant. This was very heavily used by Native Americans. It's used a lot for the seed. It's got a 
huge seed that uh, uh, was, like I say, very, very uh, prominently used by our Native Americans. Uh, now we get up a little higher uh, in this in the dry and mixed conifer and this in the mixed conifer stands here is uh, pine grass is a, uh, a interesting species. It's not a bunch grass by any means. It's a uh, sod forming grass and it can drop down roots a long, long way into the ground. And this is another one that's kind of interesting. It, it becomes a species that is non-palatable to most uh, grazing animals, grass grazing ungulates, uh, grass grazing critters. Uh, it becomes non-palatable after about nine years if there's no disturbance to it. And isn't it kind of interesting that the natural fire regime in those areas uh, where this grows was, uh, you know, six to ten years, something like that. And so it get it used to get refreshed on a regular basis and became, it was a very palatable grass, it tasted good. But after about nine years, it becomes almost a non-palatable species. So it's a, it's a grass that adapted to fire, is fire resistant and somewhat fire, res, very fire resilient. It can burn off the entire top of this and it'll, it'll come back from the, uh, uh, the roots the following season. A sedge, there are several different sedges that grow in the uh, uh, mixed conifer types. And there are some, obviously, that grow in, in all four types that I talked about. The further you get out into the sage step, you need to be very close to water for a sedge to uh, successfully uh, uh, colonize and maintain itself. But if you have a species up in the mixed conifer, this is almost the xeric species, some of the species of sedge are. Okay, stop there for a second and uh, see if there's any questions about where we're at so far and see if we're starting to make some of the dots come together. Hi, Al. I don't see any questions in the questions box. And just a time check, we've got about eight minutes left. Okay, we are getting close to the end. But thank you for that. Okay, then we'll just move right on ahead. Is, uh, is, is, uh, let's see where are we at here. Okay, landscape zone two is that's when we can introduce all the species that we had, and then we can start introducing shrubs and small deciduous trees in that area close to the house. Uh, we're going to pick up the pace here a little bit. Uh, so this is the vegetation within five to 30 feet from a home. And I mentioned we want the area to be lean, clean, and green. We want single trees. Once they start, once they get up and start growing, we want them pruned up about 10 feet. Obviously, small trees, we don't want to prune them any more than 50% of the total height of the tree. So we want to maintain 50% canopy on all trees, at least 50%. Uh, single shrubs and they're well groomed and we spread them out so and I'll talk about this in a second no dead fuels and no continuous ground fuels shrubs they offer variety most of the shrubs I've been talking about are xeric they don't take a lot of moisture they offer a food source for a variety of different animals and they offer shade and cover uh, again that I, I was challenged but trying to figure out what to put up here what to show you is there's lots of different shrubs, but uh, one of my favorites is mock orange, okay? And it is a very colorful shrub, uh, offers a lot of variety, and has got a huge uh, range of where it can grow in the different soil types. Over here on the other side, not quite the same, Redozier dogwood is a beautiful uh, plant, extremely fire resistant, but it does take a fair amount of moisture to keep it good and healthy. Service berry and woods rose. Um, these are both two species that are very xeric. And uh, this one here offers a pretty flowering arrangement uh, early in the spring. It's one of the first to flower out. Woods rose, on the other hand, can carry flowers throughout the season. Uh, a couple other ones, uh, elderberry. This is one, obviously, you got lots of berries off that that you can make wine, jam, jelly, whatever. And Golden Current, both of these are offer nice, beautiful uh, uh, 
a variety of colors throughout and they um, do well with very little moisture or watering. Spirea, a nice summertime block and, and shading some or uh, screening some things out. Shrubby sinkafoil is a plant that it, it's an interesting plant. I, uh, I won't talk about it too much, but it, depending on where you live and the weather you're getting in that season, it will either be an evergreen or deciduous, depending on the climate and uh, just how cold it gets or cold it doesn't get. Uh, Kinnikinick, a low growing, uh, it's actually a manzanita plant. But I don't think it ever gets more than two inches off the ground. And it's a very nice cover. Uh, you can drape them over rocks, cover rocks, rock walls, or have them laying on the ground. Beautiful plant that does a lot of nice cover. And uh, uh, Oregon grape, there's a, a number of varieties, but the natural one that we have here on the west side rarely gets 18 inches tall. And again, offers a great variety and very low moisture content or uh, requirement. Just a quick thing on trees and shrubs is is uh, when you have shrubs in this landscape zone too, uh, you want to keep them. If say for example, if the shrub is two feet tall, you want to double that distance apart. So if, if it's two feet tall, you want them four feet apart. If it's three feet tall, six feet apart. And then as you get on the slope, some other things, you need to start increasing that space because of the uh, heat that rises, the uh, convective heat that can warm stuff up. But on flat ground, if you use double the distance of the height. So again, just kind of a, uh, this is that landscape zone to the idea. If one plant catches on fire from spots, from embers landing inside your yard, then it's no big deal. You may lose a plant, but you won't have the opportunity for it to spread. So I will skip this part and we will just move right along unless there's anything burning. Is there uh, any questions hot? No, I think we can hold these till the end. Okay, great. So now we want to get into landscape zone three. Like I say, everything that's in landscape one and two can be planted in three. But now you can start introducing larger trees, uh, larger native and adaptive shrubs, uh, again, native and adaptive taller grasses that I was talking about earlier out in landscape zone three, because what you're after there is, again, if something does catch on fire out there, it's going to be low intensity. And so you have trees that are well spaced, no ladder fuels, which a ladder fuel means it, uh, something planted underneath another. Uh, for example, a shrub planted underneath a tree. And if the shrub catches on fire, that in turn will catch the tree on fire. We don't want that to happen. No ladder fuels. Shrubs cared for and cleaned, uh, dead fuels removed, surface and ground fuels discontinuous or low, and trees pruned up at least 10 feet. Uh, so now we just talk about some trees, some a couple of native trees. I'm not going to talk about very many and their need for moisture. One I was going to talk about here is net leaf hackberry. It used to be a, uh, they were never common. They were scattered throughout a lot of our sage step area. Uh, it's a great tree from a wildlife standpoint. It produces all kinds of wonderful benefits for wildlife. And, and uh, it's, it's almost, uh, it's, I won't call it extinct, but very uncommon in our area now. Um, I, I know where several of these are and a few of them out on the desert in eastern Oregon, uh, but it's it's really starting to disappear. Pacific willow was another one that was common, uh, again, out on the sage step and uh, uh, pretty much rare. As we move up closer into the forest types, a couple of hardwoods that I've mentioned, aspen, uh, aspen is a tree that is extremely susceptible to fire, and it has uh, the bark thickness is the, about the same thickness as your fingernail, and so the the chlorophyll material is right underneath the bark, so they die very rapidly 
in, in low intense fires. However, what you're managing in aspen is the root system, the underground root system. And the roots of aspen are very low, very shallow, I should say, and they will sprout. If you were to run a fire through here, uh, it would not be uncommon to get 60 to 70,000 stems per acre coming up following a fire. So aspen reproduces from the roots. It's called a, a, a coppice cloning forest. All these trees are one plant. It's a single, the fact, the largest plant in the world is an aspen stand in somewhere in central Utah. They're all connected. If, if you look at them, all the branching angles are the same and all the characteristic, they're all twins in some way or other. Another one that I just mentioned here real quick is big leaf maple. It's, uh, it takes a little bit more moisture, north aspects, and uh, but, it, but it's a great tree native to the area and offers a great variety. Uh, one tree that I thought I'd mention, but I won't take too much time on this. Uh, Y'all remember the, uh, the space capsules that we first used in the Apollo and the other uh, other uh, uh, space ex early ex space exploration. There was a one-time use capsule where we, we would send the guys up into space and they would come back into Earth's orbit and it would be glowing and it, you'd see all these uh, pieces of metal flying off. And that's why they can only use it once because it eroded all the metal off. Well, what they did, this was made up of a composite, laminated metal, different types of metal put together. And so it would dissipate the heat because there was such intense heat as it came back into the atmosphere. Well, they got the idea from a ponderosa pine tree because as fire moves into a ponderosa pine tree, the bark, if you ever looked at it, it's like puzzle bark and it flips off. If you heat the bark up, little pieces just shoot out. And following a fire, you'll see the black bark, you know, where it got scorched. But if you look out about 20 feet around the tree, you'll see all kinds of pieces of little bark puzzle pieces that have kicked off. And they got the idea for this space thing from a ponderosa pine tree. Enough on that. Here's kind of a summary of the uh, uh, landscape zones, zones one, two, and three, and the types of vegetation that best fit in those. Like I say, anything in landscape zone one can be used in landscape zones two and three, but not the reverse. You don't want to move these types of stuff in the landscape zone one. And again, just to summarize, and this is the different landscape zones. And if you think about it, you know, this is the homeowner's responsibility. And it gives you a great, if you start tall, medium to small, if you will, in here. And the probability, if you do this right, you have an extreme high probability of a house surviving even the most intense fires. Uh, one of the things that is often lacking is we think if we plant a fire resistant piece of vegetation that we don't need to do anything. Well, that's not true. Even with native vegetation, it still takes some actions that we need to do. One of the things that people don't think about a lot is washing plants out, taking up, I'm not talking about taking a pressure washer and washing a plant, but, but just taking a hose, a garden hose and using the straight stream and blowing it out and just cleaning it up good and getting the old stuff out and then coming up underneath the plant and getting, during the middle of the summer when it's hot and dry, that's a great time to do it because then you can keep nice and cool when you're doing that. Pruning, raking, I don't know if I need to go through all of these. Uh, I've talked about the mulches. It's okay to use inorganic mulches out in zones two and three, but please don't use organic mulches in zone landscape zone one. Watering is, is I am not a fan of all of overhead sprinklers or anything like that, is I think drip irrigation with these plants and sometimes the smallest nozzle that you can get are the ones to use. Uh, cleaning out roots, uh, roofs and gutters. Oh, a lot of things that people used to do is they do a wonderful job of cleaning up their yard and then throw it on the downhill side of where they live out in the wildland, which when a fire starts, that's the heat that's going to burn your house. So don't do that. So the value of native plants, this is I'm going to summarize here is 
they're hardy. You don't need to worry about the hardiness zone. As uh, Lisa was talking about, the different hardiness zones. Here in eastern Washington, we're in a hardiness zone anywhere from maybe a 7, 8 on the warmer side all the way down to a 4. But all of these plants that I talked about fit well and grow well in those zones. Uh, Zeric, almost every one of them is Zeric within their appropriate biome. They're all fire adapted. They have the right types of things, and the ones that I talked about here are fire resistant. And they don't take a lot of maintenance. On the other hand, though, they do need maintenance. And they provide benef uh, They provide habitat for beneficial, key word there, beneficial insects and critters, is if we have a well-maintained lawn or uh, area, is these insects that we get are nice. They are not the ones that we have to do uh, call the bad guys or the pest management for. And they're in harmony with the local environment, okay? So everything, if you keep all the pieces together, things will stay stable and will stay sustainable even during some uh, disturbance events. So anyway, that's the value of native plants. And one of the other things we wrote in, you don't have to order them on Amazon. You can get them lo locally. So with that, I just kind of the idea of the home ignition zone is very important concept to keep in mind that we have a responsibility to manage that. It's not the fire department and it's not the federal government or the state government that has any authority inside these areas. So with that, I would uh, wrap it up, and if there's any questions, how are we doing for time? You are Thanks fantastic. So much, Alex. Yeah, that is fantastic. What a wonderful presentation. Yes. So, how much time uh, would you like to take for questions, Heather? Um, let's see. Do we have how many? Let's see. Does anyone have We've any a questions? couple of questions? Okay, let's let's take a couple, and then uh, that way we can take a break um, before okay. uh, before the, uh, Heather joins us. The other Heather. All right, sounds good. Yeah, we have a question here, Al. Um, could this rainy fall lead to a bigger wildflower bloom in the spring? Uh, yes, it could. Um, is is uh, as I mentioned. It depends on the species and depends on their growth habitats. Uh, without getting into too much, some plants grow uh, flower in the fall. Other plants flower in the spring, summer. And, and the ones that are able to suck up the moisture and turn that, some sugars into carbohydrates and all that kind of good stuff and store that in the roots will make some wonderful, wonderful opportunity for both an early bloom and a uh, healthy bloom. Now, last year, my observation, this is totally observation, opinion, not scientific, was probably one of the prettiest uh, balsam root years I've ever seen. And I believe that was caused by the early spring and all the warm temperatures. But if you noticed, they were gone awfully early. Uh, they desiccated rather rapidly. But we had a beautiful uh, uh, season for uh, rapid flowering. And sometimes the more flowers you see, just the same as the more cones you see on a tree, is telling you something's going on, something's under stress. There could be something like climate change or something like that. So hopefully that answers that. Perfect. I think so. Thank you. Is there time for one more question, Heather? Um, let's see. Why don't we take a quick break? Um, Al, are you going to be okay. around for a few? Yes, I will stick around. I will stay around for the whole session. Okay. So maybe we'll see if we can pick up some other of those at the end. But let's go ahead and take a quick break, folks. Let's come back um, at 11.05. We'll give you a 10-minute break. And, uh, and we will uh, join again with Heather Holm. Uh, who is our nationally renowned uh, speaker next. And uh, wonderful. Go, go, to, go stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, and we'll be back here in 10 minutes. <laughs> 